So I want to start off uh, today um, rather more briefly than I intended before, uh, because I spent too long pontificating yesterday, um, telling you a little bit about uh, uh, what kinds of um, uh, what sorts of scenarios, very different kinds of scenarios for LHC physics are suggested by the presence of the landscape, and in particular the possibility that we'll see unnatural theories uh, in the landscape, uh, unnatural theories at the LHC. And I'm just going to tell you uh, about a few such theories and tell you about some of their striking experimental signatures. And really, the bottom line is that the mere idea that a landscape might exist, even without understanding it in great detail, at least suggests other possibilities for what we might expect at the TEV scale with very different kinds of experimental signatures, often very, very striking signatures, which if we see them, won't prove that there's a landscape, won't, uh, that they won't do any of those things. They will prove that we see a very, very fine-tuned theory at the weak scale. And um, that would, I think, give us even more circumstantial evidence, even more of a push. Uh, if we see fine-tuning in the particle physics sector of the theory, it's very hard to imagine that there is some deep mechanism for the cosmological constant. And so I think it would, uh, in concert, push us more uh, towards uh, uh, believing that the, the landscape might be real. So um, while it's very often said that there is no you know, nothing from experiment can have any impact on, on, on the landscape. It, it, it really isn't true. Of course, it isn't a direct one-to-one -one falsification. Nothing that, nothing that we see at the LHC will either prove the landscape is real or prove that it isn't real. But we can certainly get evidence uh, for things that are shocking from the point of view of normal theories with naturalness, but are quite plausible from the point of view of uh, uh, the landscape. And anyway, I think that's, uh, that's, that's very interesting. So let me um, preface this by saying that there was a very old dream, um, uh, at least for, for those people who believed that the cosmological constant problem was telling us that we're missing something very big about, about physics. The old dream was that whatever the solution to the cosmological constant problem was would dictate a lot also what the nature of the solution to some of the other problems in physics would look like, like the hierarchy problem, for example. And while there are lots of attempts at dynamical solutions to the cosmological constant problem, none of them um, substantiated that dream. Whereas at least there's a qualitative picture in the landscape for such a link. And I just want to tell you about this, because this is something that, again, has nothing to do with measures or cosmology or any of very, very deep issues. Suppose there are two regions in the landscape. There's region one, region two. And uh, in this region, let's say, um, Susie's broken at very high energies. Okay. So Susie's broken at very high energies. There's no mechanism uh, for solving the hierarchy problem. But it just so happens that in this region, there's 10 to the 200 vacua. You just count and count, and you find 10 to the 200 vacua there. Now suppose there's another region in the landscape where Susie's broken at a TEV. Okay. But you count and you count, and you know by the time you get the standard model and things that look like our world for the rest of it, you just don't find more than 10 to the 40 vacua, just to pick a random number. OK? Now, the numbers here in the exponents, 40, 200, you know, this is all in the schlock as far as, uh, as, far as the degree to which we understand uh, the counting of vacua in the landscape. I don't know that it looks like this, but it might look like this. There might be a preference for very high energy Susie breaking, for example. So now, I find this extremely, extremely interesting. Because if you're a particle physicist and you didn't care about gravity at all, where would you expect to live? You'd say, obviously, I'm living here. right? Here, the hierarchy problem is solved. You don't have to fine tune for the weak scale and so on. You're just done. But interestingly, uh, because you also have to solve the cosmological constant problem, much as you would like to live there from the point of view of particle physics, you simply cannot and also solve the cosmological constant problem. This has nothing to do with measures. It has nothing to do with anything. It's simply that 10 to the 40 isn't a big enough number to be able to find a vacuum with small enough vacuum energy. So even though particle physics wants you to live on the right, cosmology and the cosmological constant problem tells you you can't. Okay, so this is the first time uh, that I've seen even a thought for what could solve the CC problem that immediately has an implication for what particle physics might look like. You see, in this case, 
It's a cosmological constant problem that's telling you you have to live here instead. And you have to fine tune for the weak scale. But you have to do it because this is the only place you can also solve the cosmological constant problem. So at least there's a possible logical link between these two big problems. And I want to stress that, the, 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 the numbers here are so big, the 10 to the 120 for the cosmological constant dwarfs the 10 to the 30 for the hierarchy problem. So it's not implausible that it might look like this. Of course, maybe it looks the other way around. <laughs> okay. Um, we can't know ahead of time until we know a lot more about what the vacuum will look like. But it's at least a logical possibility that links the problems and shows that the solution to the CC problem drives you to a place that looks unnatural from the point of view of particle physics. Yes? Uh, right. Oh, well, then, then you would naively think that you should live here. Uh, but then questions about measures and all of that stuff starts coming up. So I, I, I don't know, OK? Uh, until you understand all of cosmology, population, all of these deep things, then, then I really can't say. And I, um, but this is why I deliberately chose an example like this, <laughs> at least a, 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 a plausible set of numbers for which you don't even have to answer that question. And it's clear where you have to end up. I'm not saying this is the way it has to be. I'm just saying that this is a sort of very plausible picture. You know, uh, it just says that, that, that the presence of a landscape gives us an additional factor to factor into our notion of naturalness. And uh, what looks natural from the point of view of a monovacuum theory uh, might be impossible from the point of view theory of the landscape. The presence of a landscape can radically alter your notion of naturalness. And that's all for the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I want to take from the landscape. That we now have license to talk about theories that might be finely tuned, as long as, as I mentioned last time, we can come up with a reason why the parameters that are being finely tuned are associated with the uh, environmental disasters. Okay? And as I also said at the end of last time, that appears to be the case in the standard model, both for the cosmological constant and for the Higgs mass parameter. Yes? <laughs> That, that's right. No, what, 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 but, but I'm saying in this entire region, Susie's broken it incredibly high energies. Okay. All I'm saying is that even without understanding measures, it might be impossible to find a vacuum that simultaneously solves the hierarchy problem and the cosmological constant problem. And this isn't crazy. You know, technical is a beautiful solution to the hierarchy problem. But it could be that you look and you look and you look, and there's only 10 to the 30 vacua that have something that looks like technicolor. Tough luck, right? You know, uh, from the particle physics point of view, it looks great. But from cosmology, you can't do it. And as I said, you know, people wanted, fantasized about such a connection between this very deep problem of the CC and particle physics. And this is the first kind of concrete connection along those lines that I've, I've ever seen. OK. okay. Now, as I mentioned last time, the first possibility is just the standard model as a fine-tuned theory. But we don't have dark matter, and we don't have uh, unification with the standard model. And I just want to make a general comment that even the ignoring the hierarchy problem, um, the nicest, by nicest I mean the only calculable uh, theory for dark matter that we have, namely WIMPs, um, is a completely independent motivation for having new particles at the TEV scale. Okay, so if you'd never heard of the hierarchy problem, um, but you had the idea that maybe dark matter came from particles that were once in thermal equilibrium and the universe cooled, and then you're left with some freeze out abundance of them, then the mass that those particles need to have is around a TEV. Totally independent of the hierarchy problem. Let me review briefly how that argument works. You know, let's say we have some new kinds of particle, and uh, there are some interactions that I won't even bother specifying uh, that keep them in thermal equilibrium with standard model particles. And let's say the cross section for that interaction is sigma. If we imagine that we're at temperatures way above the mass of the particle, uh, then this particle is in thermal equilibrium with everything else. It has a reasonable number density, comparable to the number density for everything else. Now, forget about the expanding universe in a second. Imagine you had a big box, and you heated the box up to temperatures way above the mass of the particle. And now you started dialing the temperature down adiabatically. What would happen? Well, when the temperature fell beneath the mass of the particle, there would be a Boltzmann suppression. Okay? 
Why? Well, because it's, it's easier for the particles to annihilate into massless particles than for the massless particles to go out along the tails of the Boltzmann distribution to have enough energy to repopulate and remake the massive one. And if you just adiabatically dial down the temperature, well, the number density would eventually go to zero. Right? Just e to the minus uh, <coughs> e to the minus m over t would eventually take you to zero. Clear? Now, what happens when the universe is expanding is something interesting. It's not the same as being in a box and gradually lowering the temperature, because also all the particles are getting diluted at the same time. Okay? So what happens is that at some point, it just becomes impossible for the particles to stay in thermal equilibrium, roughly speaking, because the density of these dark matter particles drops so low that they can't find each other to annihilate. Okay? So when does that happen? That happens when the rough interaction distance associated with this uh, interaction becomes comparable to the Hubble expansion, to, to the Hubble scale. So, so the interaction distance is around 1 over the number density of this particle times its cross section. And so it's when this becomes comparable to 1 over Hubble uh, that, uh, that the number density can't go any lower. OK, so let's, this is n. Sigma is comparable to h. h, when the universe has a temperature t, is the temperature squared divided by m Planck. This is all happening when the temperature is roughly the mass of the particle, clearly. So this is around m squared over m Planck. So this gives me a nice uh, expression for the energy density in the dark matter particle, which is its number density times its mass. And this is m cubed over m Planck sigma. Okay. Past less than this row, you, they can't annihilate anymore. Okay, so it drops, it's dropping exponentially until it hits that value and it can't go down anymore. And there's a nice quantity to talk about in general in cosmology. Uh, the rho divided by the temperature cubed, energy density per entropy. This quantity is uh, time independent, roughly, because rho is dropping like the temperature and the temperature is dropping like the, the temperature. So this is an invariant quantity. Okay? And so what is this quantity? Since the temperature is around m, this is just 1 over sigma m Planck. So, and we exper experimentally, we know what this number is. Okay, rho over t cubed, which is independent of time, we know its value today. Its value today is around 10 to the minus 3 electron volts. And that unambiguously tells us what the cross section is. And the cross section is around the weak scale. It's around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters squared, roughly speaking, just putting numbers in. So, if we're talking about perturbative processes involving some particle, then that also tells us that the particle has got to be at around the weak scale. Because, you know, sigma is going like some, if it was any kind of diagram like this, sigma is going like some g to the fourth over m squared just by dimensional analysis. And that tells us that m has to be around a TEV. Okay, so this is a famous argument that tells us for the only calculable theory we have for dark matter that its mass has got to be around the TEV scale if it's coming from the relic abundance of a particle that froze out. OK, so there is a reason to see something at the TEV scale. Of course, dark matter doesn't have to be WIMPs. It could be axions. It could be one of a hundred things. But what's nice, this is the only calculable theory we have. It's very plausible. So there is a reason to have something at the TEV scale. So dark matter tells us if it's a WIMP, and if, so let's say that there is a landscape. Let's say the weak scale is finely tuned. There's a reason not to expect nothing beyond the standard model. Okay? And if it's, a dark, if it's a WIMP, whatever the thing is should show up at the TEV scale. OK. Now, in fact, <clears throat> there's a very natural candidate for what such an unnatural theory should be. Um, remember, the nice things about supersymmetry uh, were first and foremost unification uh, and dark matter. Okay. Um, so in SUSY, we have unification and dark matter. And then we had all the nagging problems. And um, a few seconds thought 
makes it clear that the nagging problems of the new particles that Susie adds, the nagging problems all have to do with the scalar superpartners. Okay? There's a good reason for this. It's because, you know, uh, let's say we have a, here's a diagram that could contribute to the magnetic or electric dipole moment of the electron. Just to give you an example. Here's an electron. There's a selectron in the loop, maybe a fotino. Okay? Let me not be too specific about what these arrows mean. I attach, here's a selectron. Okay? Um, well, this is a diagram that uh, contributes to the electric dipole moment of the electron if there's CP violation. And if the phases are of order one, it's big. This is one of the problems. The phases can't be one. They've got to be small. Okay? Or things having to do with flavor changing neutral currents. I, I could draw a similar diagram with a muon here. Okay? Uh, again, that has to do with scalars in the loop. All the problems have to do with scalars in the loop. Okay? So you would remove all of these problems. I mean, all the problems that are uh, that that uh, just afflict uh, comparison with data. You'd remove all of them if you poof the scalars up. Let's say I don't know to a thousand to EV. Okay, if you move them to a thousand to EV, they can have any pattern of masses they want, anything they want. There's nothing wrong. No disagreement with uh, with uh, experiment. Now, the zeroth order thing you might want to do is hoof everything to 1,000 TeV. You say Susie's broken at 1,000 TeV. Well, as far as the weak scale theory is concerned, that's just the same as the standard model and nothing, and nothing else up to 1,000 TeV. And it still doesn't give us a good candidate for dark matter. Okay. But there is one thing you can do, which is more or less the only other way you're allowed to split the particles. Okay. And that's associated with a very simple observation that the only thing that protects the scalar masses is supersymmetry. But there's the fermions of supersymmetry as well, the Gaginos and the Higginos. And while the fermions are protected by two things, they're protected by supersymmetry and also a chiral symmetry. They're fermions after all. Okay. So it's in particular the R symmetry of the MSSM can, even if supersymmetry is broken, the R symmetry can ensure that the fermions are alive. So if you forget everything about naturalness for a second and just ask, how are you allowed to split the particles in Susie? If they're not all going to be roughly the same scale, well, the only way that's consistent is to have the scalars heavy and the Gaginos light. The Gaginos and the Higginos light. Okay? Just from a theoretical point of view. Of course, the theory is finely tuned because the scalars are heavy. So the scalar superpartners of the top quark, for example, are heavy. And the quadratic divergences are canceled at a very high energy scale. So the theory is finely tuned. But this is the heresy. Um, uh, but this is what you say. We use the words Susie and fine tuning in the same sentence. And we say that the Gagino, so the Gluino, the Bino, the Wino, and the Higginos are at the TEV scale. And the scalars are much heavier. This is what we called split. Actually, Giudice and Romanino called split Susie. Yes? Sorry? Maybe the scalars are very, very heavy. Okay. So of course, the heavier and heavier the scalars get, the, uh, the heavier and heavier the scalars get, the more and more finely tuned the, uh, the uh, theory becomes. Uh, but I think, I think you're asking the question is, why is there any Susie at all? Uh, in, in this point of view. And um, I, don't have, uh, I don't have an excellent answer to that question, but uh, the words I mumble are maybe for UV reasons having to do with stability, having to do with uh, things having to do with physics at much, much higher energies. It's important to have a little bit of Susie beneath the Planck scale or the string scale. And Eva disagrees even with this statement. Maybe we don't need any Susie at all for microscopic consistency. And that's uh, then, uh, but, uh, but I'm saying, there's, at least to me, a plausible story that maybe we're in a class of, uh, there's a class of vacua where Susie's broken moderately beneath the fundamental scale. Um, although I'm leaving it as a free parameter for this exercise. Okay? They have to be heavier than 100 or 1,000 TeV to solve all the problems. Maybe they could go all the way up to somewhere beneath the gut scale. Okay. okay. So, but what I want to say is that if we abandon naturalness, but we imagine that there was some SUSY beneath the fundamental scale, then this is one of two allowed possibilities. Okay? What's interesting about this is that this theory preserves both of these good features of SUSY. It preserves dark matter 
for the obvious reason. I still have the candidate dark matter particles floating around at the weak scale. These neutralinos, for example, one of them, the lightest one, can still be the dark matter particle. It also preserves, oh, sorry, I should say, let me be more specific, one Higgs, a single Higgs, single Higgs should be light. Remember, if Susie has two Higgses, the second Higgs should be heavy. OK? That was part of my uh, philosophy, right? There's no reason to have two light Higgses. Uh, all I need uh, for having atoms and all that stuff is one Higgs. So, so the Higgs is also separate. OK. So obviously, I mean, before saying anything else, this theory can be falsified immediately if the LHC sees a single scalar superpartner. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so there should be no scalar superpartners. But we should see the fermions of the MSSM and uh, a single Higgs. Ah, I didn't tell you why unification isn't, isn't affected, but it's, it's kind of obvious. You see, all of these scalars of the standard model come in complete multiplets of SU5. And complete multiplets of SU5 don't affect the fact that couplings unify. Do you guys all know this fact? If you don't know it, just imagine looking at this picture with the unification of couplings. And imagine that these are all little runners. Okay, So they're running. Okay, And go to the frame of reference of this runner. Okay, in the frame of reference of that runner, they see this runner coming uh, at them with uh, velocity beta function 3 minus beta function 2. And they see the other guy coming at them with velocity beta function 2 minus beta function 1. So anything, any way you change the beta functions that doesn't change the difference of the beta functions does not affect whether or not the couplings unify. And multiplets of SU5, of course, give equal contributions to the beta function for 3, 2, and 1, precisely because 3, 2, 1 is embedded nicely into SU5. So the scalars of the MSSM, and indeed the gauge fields of the MSSM, and the fermions of the standard model, okay, never contributed to the unification of couplings. The only thing that's important for the unification of couplings are the split multiplets, the things that do not come in complete SU5 multiplets. And those are the gauginos. Sorry, I said it wrong. Of course, the gauge fields do matter because they're not in complete SU5 multiplets. But the matter fields never did. So it's the gauginos and higginos of SUSY that matter for unification, not the scalars. So I find this very amusing, that the one thing that giving you all the headaches as far as why we haven't seen uh, physics and rare decays, why we haven't seen all this, that one thing uh, is also irrelevant to the two major successes, concrete successes of the theory. It's needed just for one thing. It's needed for naturalness. Okay. Of course, it's not a light thing to throw out naturalness, but I remind all of you that even our favorite supersymmetric theories, with the scalars as heavy as everything else, is already very finely tuned, at least to a part in 10 to the 60, for the cosmological constant problem. So the attitude's always been, ooh, tuning bad. Let's do as little of it as possible. You're already doing 60 orders of magnitude, and you're fussing over another 10 or 20 or 30. Well, we're saying it's possible there's another picture. It's possible that the tuning for the cosmological constant is suggesting that some of these parameters just are tuned. The ones that can have environmental explanations are tuned. And then there's a kind of unified picture for where the, uh, uh, where the tunings come from for the CC and the hierarchy problem. But it leads to this picture, which is totally removes all of the experimental difficulties with SUSY, preserves unification in dark matter. But most interestingly to me, it has very, very specific experimental predictions. Okay. And rather very different than conventional theories. And uh, uh, some of them are rather spectacular. So one interesting thing is that in this low energy theory with the scalars gone, there are now very, very few parameters. Okay. Many, many fewer parameters than there were before. In particular, we have the Yukawa couplings between the Geginos and the Higginos. Those are the only new couplings that, that, that we have. So the Wino and the Bino coupling to the Higgs and the Higginos. So there are four Yukawa couplings here, lambda 1, 2, 3, 4. And of course, there's a quartic coupling of the Higgs. Let's throw that lambda. So there are five coupling constants, dimensionless coupling constants uh, in this theory beyond uh, the ones that we're used to. Well, the quartic coupling is one of the ones that we're, we're used to. But as usual in SUSY, these five coupling constants are determined by supersymmetry. They're, 
They're related to the gauge couplings by supersymmetry. These are the gauge Yukawa couplings, and the quartic coupling comes from the D term. But of course, these five couplings are take their supersymmetric values at the scale where Susie is good, which is now very high. So you should expect that these five couplings, so if I were to schematically make a plot, or schematically make a plot of these couplings divided by the value predicted by Susie, so here's one, then there's five couplings that at the scale where the heavy scalars are, are all given are all one, but under the renormalization group, they scale to different values at low energies. So in principle, we can measure five coupling constants. Principle possible at the weak scale. We see these particles, we measure five coupling constants, we extrapolate them all up, and now five lines should converge to a point. That's a quite striking prediction. And if this happens, I think this is very, very, again, we're not directly seeing the super partners, but it's very strong evidence that there is a mini desert going up to where the scalars are. That means that there's no way that there's any new particle around the corner that was going to solve the hierarchy problem. Okay, we really see that there's a desert up to this much higher energy scales. Definitely the weak scale is very, very tuned. But we also discover supersymmetry at the same time. Okay. OK, that's a quantitative prediction. And there's also a qualitative prediction. The qualitative prediction is, uh, is uh, interesting because the Galeno in this theory ends up being a relatively long-lived particle. And the reason is that the Galeno normally de would decay through a squark through this kind of interaction. But the squark is now very off-shell. It's very massive. So this goes back, to, let's say, to a quark and a photino. But the squark here is very heavy. So that means that this lifetime is long. How long? Well, it depends how heavy the scalars are. If the scalars are as heavy as about 1,000 TeV, it's still a relatively short lifetime. But the gluinos, once produced, will, will travel between a millimeter and a centimeter away from the beam line when they decay. That's a very striking, that's a very striking signal. You're making a new strongly interacting particle that isn't decaying from the beam line where it was made, but displaced away from it. And of course, if the scalars get heavier, then this guy, you know, the, the lifetime is going like the scalar mass to the fourth. And so um, uh, this thing could travel a meter before decaying. It could just barrel through the detector before decaying. And then there's all sorts of amusing things that happen. It turns out that some decent fraction of the time, the gluinos, once produced, actually stop in the detector. They live long enough. They get stopped by the material in the detector. And then they sit there for a day or a week or a year, and then they decay. So it's like little bombs going off in the detector itself. So, so these are very unusual signals, all of which are very indicative here that you're making a new strongly interacting particle. It's a color adjoint, but it's not decaying quickly. Why isn't it decaying quickly? Well, it's decaying through very, very heavy scalars. Okay? And so this is the indirect indication that the scalars are very heavy. So, all I, so I'm not, I don't want to go into too much more detail about this. I just want to say this is one example, one example of a sort of theory that's suggested by the landscape. It solves the problems of SUSY. It has interesting experimental signals. And um, if we see it, I think it would, it would uh, push, it'd certainly push me into believing that something like the landscape is, is correct. Now, I want to stress. So this argument that we have to see fermions at the TeV scale is because of dark matter. Okay? And it is not true that over the entire region of the parameter space of this theory, these particles are accessible at the LHC. Okay? They're always close. They're always close. But, uh, but in detail, for example, you could have weakly interacting particles at one TeV as beautiful dark matter candidates. And it's just very hard to make them at the LHC. Okay? The LHC is very good at making weakly interacting particles at 400 GeV and strongly interacting particles at 3 TeV. But weakly interacting particles at 1 TeV and you're a little screwed. So I can't prove there's no absolute guarantee, even if the scenario is right, that we will necessarily see uh, uh, all the particles. But you know, over a large portion of the parameter space where the dark matter works out, um, the particles are accessible. Okay? And so the LHC could either completely refute this theory 
by finding a single not needed, uh, a single particle, uh, by seeing one slepton or one squark, okay? It could confirm it completely or largely confirm it by seeing these things, or we could be in the unfortunate intermediate uh, situation where its status is, uh, is uh, unclear. But um, anyway, that's life. And uh, I think this is a relatively, personally think this is a relatively plausible scenario for what might happen at the, uh, at the uh, LHC. Okay? And it, again, I want to stress, if it happens, it's really echoing the biggest result in cosmology in the last, <laughs> in our lifetimes, right? This cosmology experiment shows there's a cosmological constant appears to be finely tuned. And then particle physics would come in and say, the other parameter we thought would have a natural explanation just does not, okay? And um, just to be clear, why do we know, let's say we saw the Higgs and nothing else. Would people give up on naturalness? Not obvious. It's not obvious because you might still say, oh, maybe it's around a percent tuned or 10 to the minus 3 tuned. And those kind of tunings happen. And maybe the squarks were there at 6 TeV and we just missed them. Okay? You could always say that. It wouldn't smell too good, but you could always say that. If you see this, you, can't, you don't even have that. You know you have lots of indirect evidence that the next scale is much, much above the TeV scale. So there's just tremendous tuning. Okay? That's what we would know invariantly if this scenario is verified. And, but as I said, that carries a lot of psychological and scientific uh, implications if you become convinced that the weak scale is tuned. Yes? Right. No, no, no. No, that, that's, uh, that, it, it, it obscures unification. Uh, we, we thought, I mean, uh, the, the short answer is no. Uh, um, it, 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 it only obscures gut relations between scalar particles. And anyway, I'm, I'm not even talking about any such, uh, any such uh, relations here. So um, uh, we would be lucky if we could figure out the spectroscopy of the heavy states were from, uh, from uh, low energy. Um, which will probably be very, very hard. Uh, so, okay. All right, so that's, I think, all I want to say. Um, the uh, punchline is that, you know, many of us thought that it was a foregone conclusion that the weak scale was going to be natural, and the LHC would just reveal what that natural theory of the weak scale was. And that whole outlook has been a little shaken both by the results in cosmology, the spring landscape, the failure to see dramatic evidence for physics beyond the standard model. So it's possible that uh, the LHC might do exactly the opposite. It might actually convince us that the weak scale is finely tuned. Yes. Uh, oh, I said it's one of two possibilities if nature is supersymmetric beneath the fundamental scale for how it might show up at low energies. So you can either take the particles and have the scalars and the fermions all together, okay? Or you can, uh, uh, or you can split the scalars so the scalars are heavier than the fermions. But um, for, for, for technical reasons, it's very hard to split even the fermions internally or, or have the scalars much lighter than the fermions and so on. And it's not for hard reasons. It's because the, the scalars are only protected by SUSY, whereas the fermions are protected by both SUSY and R symmetry. All right. So now let me move on. Actually, before we move on, do you mind if I take a little break? I just need to get some. Uh, I'll be right back. Take this off. Sorry.
Um, what I think, uh, well, I certainly think, and I think many people think, is a real intellectual bottleneck in this business. The intellectual bottleneck in this business, I don't think, has to do with counting vacua or finding vacua or anything like that, although that's very important. It has to do with uh, making sense of the very peculiar picture of cosmology, which is opened up. Bye. OK. So did uh, Raphael draw you? This famous Penrose diagram? Please say yes. OK, good. All right. So, so as you know, what's strange, about this, uh, what's strange about this picture, each one of these, there's some parent de Sitter space that's decaying out into a bunch of different flat space universes, maybe other de Sitter spaces, maybe spaces with a negative cosmological constant where you have big punches inside and so on. But the main problem is that on the one hand, this picture seems very robust. Just applying long distance effective field theory at low curvatures where we think we can trust everything, we get this picture of a universe where the answer to every question is infinity. What is the volume of the universe infinite? Um, how much, if I draw a spatial slice through here, uh, how much do I have? What's the volume of one universe compared to another universe? Infinity divided by infinity. Okay? Everything doesn't make sense. Thank you. Um, so how are we supposed to think about it? Um, and one basic cautionary tale, which I think Raphael may, may have stressed, and but which I'll stress in the next two lectures from a somewhat different point of view, is that we get into all of these troubles. You see, this gives us this naive picture that there's our universe, and, and the word is and, and there's this other universe, and there's this other universe, there's this other bubble, this other de Sitter bubble, and, 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 OK? Uh, and when the word is and, you have to, then you wonder, well, why am I me? <laughs> I think that's a completely obvious statement. So, OK? Um, and yet, this picture uh, comes from applying semi classical intuition in a regime where it's apparently perfectly valid to do so. But we've known for 20 years that there is another situation where when you apply semi-classical intuition in a place where it's naively correct to do so, you get the wrong answer. And that's in the context of black hole formation and evaporation and the information paradox. So this we're going to talk about at length tomorrow. Okay? So tomorrow we're going to talk about the information problem. We're going to talk about these ideas of locality, quantum mechanics, gravity in concert, um, and how they are applied and fail in the context of black holes and then try to see if we can extract some lessons from that and apply it to this picture to see if we might get another interpretation of uh, this apparent semi-classical picture. Okay? So it's, I want to claim this is not even obviously a correct semi-classical picture. So that's what I'm going to do tomorrow. Um, but today, I, I have a more modest goal, um, which is that I just want to talk about a few um, preliminary things that have to be talked about in all of these discussions anyway, but which aren't normally talked about all in the same place. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and it's all very basic. You've probably heard a lot of it before, but I'm going to just try to talk about them all uni uniformly in, uh, uh, today. And it all has to do with um, basic things about quantum mechanics. See, this question brings up very vividly uh, how we deal with quantum mechanics and cosmology at the same time. Okay. And everyone who's thought about this for 30 seconds gets the same confusions. How are you supposed to apply quantum mechanics to the universe? There's one universe. Doesn't quantum mechanics make probabilistic predictions? 
How do we, but we have one universe, so what does that mean? What does the wave function of the universe mean? Um, how are we supposed to even think about these very basic kinematical questions? And many of these questions are very simple and have simple answers. Um, and that's what, I want to, that's what I want to talk about today. So I want to talk about basic things about quantum mechanics that we'll then use tomorrow uh, over and over again when we turn on gravity and see how some of these concepts are, uh, are affected by the presence of uh, gravity. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about a variety of things. And you'll see they're all basically related to each other. First, I want to um, either tell you or remind you how to properly think about, about uh, quantum mechanics. Unfortunately, this way of thinking about quantum mechanics is still not standardly taught in undergraduate courses. Um, and yet, uh, um, anyway, thinking about it properly is a crucial zeroth order step to even talking about the cosmological questions. So let me remind you what you all learned in undergraduate courses. There's three axioms of quantum mechanics. One is if, if you have uh, an observable O, then if it has, uh, if it has observables associated with Hermitian operators, the eigenvectors have a definite value for the operator lambda. OK? Right? Now, two is the probability postulate that if you happen not to be in one of these eigenstates and you measure O, if you're in the state psi and you measure O, then you get the value lambda with probability given by the overlap of psi and lambda mod squared. And three is the uh, measurement or wave function collapse postulate. <clears throat> um, well, so. So part A is that the wave function evolves unitarily in time, according to some Hamiltonian, until you make a measurement. And when you make a measurement, you collapse, uh, you collapse the wave function. In fact, if you start off with some state psi after the measurement, you're in a density matrix rho given by the sum over the eigen, the projection operators onto the eigenvalues of all weighted by the probability. OK? So everyone happy with these things? You all remember this from kindergarten? OK? Now, postulate 1 is perfectly fine. Postulates 2 and 3 are the ones that are sticky the second you start talking about things like the whole universe. Okay? That should be obvious. Um, fortunately, 2 and 3 are completely unnecessary. 2 and 3 actually follow from 1. So I want to tell you how to think about quantum mechanics with a unique wave function. One wave function. Uh, the words that go with the proper way of talking about these things, which you've probably heard, are words like decoherence and uh, consistent histories. Oh, and I forgot to say. Um, up here, again, when you're a little kid, they tell you that quantum mechanics is small and classical is large. This is also incorrect. The right words here are that quantum mechanics is a closed system and classical is an open system. Okay. So how many of you are fully versed in the ideas of decoherence, for example? I knew you would be. OK. All right, then maybe I'll go a little slower. OK. So, um, but remember, the ultimate goal is uh, to remove these um, unneeded extra postulates and understand why they're not needed. So let me get rid of the third one first. The third one is the stupidest one of all. right? It's the one that everyone who first learns quantum mechanics hates. Uh, at least I did. Really? Little old me, when I make a measurement, I do this thing when I collapse the wave function. What about my dog? Can the dog collapse the wave function? 
What about a little air molecule wandering by? Can the air molecule collapse away function? Okay. So it's totally unnecessary. There's no such thing as wave function collapse. All there is is unitary evolution of the whole wave function. Okay, but the whole wave function is a wave function not only of the system that you're looking at, but also of any environment that it might couple to. And if you keep track of unitary evolution of this giant wave function, including the system and the environment, everything makes sense. You never have to invoke wave function collapse. And for every physical question you're interested in, you get the same answers, of course, as you get from this postulate. But we understand that these things arise because of interaction with a large environment or interaction with macroscopic detectors. And this is very important. Ultimately, quantum mechanics tells you, quantum mechanics does take away predictive power, right? We've known that for a long time. But you get patted on the head and say, oh, it's OK. You, get, you still get to make probabilistic predictions. It's OK. okay? But those probabilistic predictions are associated with infinities, infinite number of measurements involving infinitely large measurement apparatuses. Okay? And that's what I want to uh, stress. And, and it's related, a completely related question. Um, in fact, we'll see the isomorphic question, is why is it that the world looks classical? The world is really quantum mechanical. Why does it look classical? The naive answer is, well, you have little well-localized wave packets. Those behave classically. But that begs the question. How come we see states in the universe as little well-localized wave packets? Why, when I walk in the room, don't I see the TV there in a state 1 over root 2 there plus there? Okay. That's the real question, why is the world classical? Why don't we see states like that in nature? Why do we instead see approximately classical, well-localized states? Okay, so I want to answer that question first. Okay. So well, let's do it in the case of this chair, or whatever the hell it is, TV. Okay. So let's say that, 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 that it was in a state AX1 plus BX2. And before I walked in the room, it was in this state. But there's other things in the room, right? There's like all the air molecules in the room, for example. Quite a lot of air molecules. 10 to the 30 air molecules in the room, give or take. But I don't know. So let's say that originally it's in this state, and the air molecules are in some state. I'll call it initial air molecule. Oh, god, I shouldn't call it that. I don't know. What did I call it here? Air. Air. Initial. All right? Now something interesting happens, though. Let me time evolve this state just a little bit, just for a little bit of time. What happens when I time, time evolve this state? Well, by linearity, so this is psi of t equals 0, right? Well, psi of t equals small is given by, well, by linearity, it's ax1. And then, now, what's going to happen? If we evolve to just a little bit of time, this thing isn't moving. But what's happened is some of the air molecules, which are whizzing around, have bounced off a bit. Right? So the air molecules were going this way. Now they're going that way. And the way they're going is correlated with where this guy was. Okay? So the new state of the air molecules, let's call the new state, air correlated with the position x1. Okay? And well, the other state is just plus b x2 air correlated with position x2. Now, a crucial, crucial fact is that those two states, air correlated with x1 and air correlated with x2, after an absolutely vanishing amount of time, minuscule amount of time, become very nearly orthogonal to each other. Okay. Air x1, air x2, at this time small, right? This is almost zero. Now why is it almost zero? I mean, let's do something just totally extreme. So there's 10 to the 30 molecules. So let's say every one of the states, so there's 10 to the 30 states, right? So let's say air 1 for each one of those, each one of the particles, and air 2 are only different by each other, I don't know, by a percent. OK, so the overlap between air 1 and air 2 is a percent. OK? Well, then what is this overlap? It's a percent 
but there's 10 to the 30 molecules. So it's a percent of the power of 10 to the 30. So it's because there's a huge number of degrees of freedom in the environment that in hardly any time at all, and the crucial thing is it has nothing to do with transferring energy, the air molecules moving this thing around. It's simply because there's lots of air molecules. And it, in enormous Hilbert spaces, it just takes tiny changes to make state orthogonal. OK? Is that clear? So in general, this goes like some e to the minus some constant time n. And that's what matters. There's an n there. So that these things incredibly, incredibly rapidly go to zero. Okay. Now that has a very important consequence. Let's say I want to compute any expectation value at all. Say I want to compute any expectation value involving the TV. Okay. Well, what do I do? So any expectation value for anything involving the TV is psi the operator made out of TV variables times psi. Okay? Well, but you see what happens here. This is equal to A mod squared x1 OTV x1 plus B mod squared x2 OTV x2. Now there are cross terms plus A star B uh, x1 OTV x2 times the overlap between air 2 and air 1, if I'm doing it right, or the other way around, plus Hermitian conjugate. This is true at any time. At t equals 0, these states, air 1 and air 2, are the same. Okay. So I have a very entangled state. But in this vanishingly tiny time, these have gone effectively to 0. And what I'm left with is that any expectation value for TV operators is either with probability A mod squared, the TV is there, or with probability B mod squared, the TV is there. But it does not look like an entangled state. Okay? So quantum coherence is an incredibly delicate thing. Minuscule interactions with the environment are enough to kill it. This is why it's so hard to build a quantum computer. So this fact that when you interact, even with tiny coupling to enormous environments, you get, deco well, it's called decoherence. But you see, there is no need to invoke wave function collapse. There is just one big wave function. It's evolving in a giant Hilbert space. But when I restrict to talking about the parts of it that I'm looking at, it behaves as if it's a mixed state. We can say that a little more formally. We can say that a little more formally by saying uh, that originally I started off with a pure state. So there's a density matrix associated with that in the whole Hilbert space, which is just psi psi. But any expectation value for TV operators, or more generally, let's call them system operators, the system I'm looking at, is a trace of psi psi times O sub s. But because this doesn't depend on any environment variables, I can rewrite this as a trace first over the environment over psi psi, and then do the trace over the system times O s. And this sucker, the trace of the environment, the trace of the environment of psi psi is called the reduced density operator. So the statement is that if I look at the reduced density operator, if at t equals zero, the reduced density operator look like a mod squared, b mod squared, a star b, and a b star for my x1, x2 basis. Then very, very rapidly, interaction with the environment evolves this to something that looks like a mod squared, b mod squared, 0, 0. Well, the 0 there means exponentially small in the number of degrees of freedom of the environment. Okay? So we don't need to separately invoke a wave function collapse hypothesis. It's just a part of the dynamics. 
And it also, now, let's, uh, let's continue and talk about measurement. Well, I don't need to do anything different. It's exactly the same. Okay. Um, let's just use different letters. Uh, so let's say I'm doing a stern gerlach experiment. <clears throat> okay. Um, oh, by the way, I, I should say something. So this explains why position eigenstates are what we see. Rough position eigenstates are what we see as the classical states in nature. It's very satisfying. It should be the quantum theory that tells you what states low classical like. And it does tell you. It tells you that there is some preferred basis in which things decohere nicely. That basis is roughly a position eigenstate basis. Why? Because interactions are local. That's why. All right, so measurement is exactly the same thing. Um, let's say we start off with alpha up plus beta down. Okay. So I have a spin, but I also have some, um, uh, I have my system and I have a measuring apparatus A. And the whole Hamiltonian is some Hamiltonian for the system, for the apparatus, and some interaction Hamilton. Okay. So now what do I do? I feed this sucker in. So I start off, the apparatus is in its ground state. Okay. Okay. Now I time evolve this state. So if this is what psi at equals zero looks like, then again, psi of t is alpha up. Now, the whole point of this being a measurement is that someone, usually an experimentalist, has built the apparatus and dialed that interaction Hamiltonian in such a way that if you feed an up spin, the apparatus flashes up, I'm up. Okay. So there's some state of the apparatus. This is the whole point of this interaction Hamiltonian, is to evolve the state up ground into the state up, I'm flashing up. And beta down, I'm flashing down. But once again, for macroscopic apparatuses, for macroscopic apparatuses, the whole point is that these ups, downs, is effectively zero. It's e to the minus the number of degrees of freedom in the apparatus. OK? And then. Isomorphic story to what we just went through. When you look at just system degrees of freedom, it looks like, after the measurement, with probability alpha mod squared, you saw up. Probability beta mod squared, you saw down. Okay, so both the measurement problem and why things look classical are because quantum mechanics allows you to make predictions when you break the system up into two parts, one part which is huge. And in fact, really formally, for any finite apparatus or finite number of air molecules, we don't get exact answers. There's some tiny exponential e to the minus n degrees of freedom. So formally in our heads, we get perfectly sharp answers in an idealized limit where we make the apparatuses arbitrarily large, or in the case of environments, when the environment contains an infinite number of degrees of freedom. OK? Happy? So whenever someone tells you that consciousness has something to do with the collapse of the wave function, what do you tell them? Right? So. <laughs> Very good. Yes? So, I followed this and I'm sorry, but why do people still saying uh, can I Can I have fun with the rest of my lecture, please? <laughs> no, we, we, we can talk about it later. Um, uh, I think they're silly. I think they're silly. But, uh, but um, they, of course, disagree. But um, uh, anyway. Minimally, I think everyone agrees. This is the explanation for when some grubby grad student, sorry, uh, is doing an experimental lab. You know, it's not some grand thing isn't happening with their consciousness, which is very limited, as you know. <laughs> okay, it's just this. All right. Okay. Um, okay. So we got rid of postulate three. Let's get rid of postulate two, the probability postulate. Here we're still talking about probabilities. Ain't no probabilities. In fact, there's really any probabilistic theory, it never is about probabilities. No, I, 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 I mean it. When you flip a coin and you say with a probability of half it comes up heads and half it comes up tails, any time you make a probabilistic prediction, 
it's secretly making a prediction with probability very close to 1 for another experiment. Okay. When I say when I flip a coin, it comes up tail to probability half. Really, I'm making a different statement that if I were to flip that coin 100 billion million times, okay, then with a probability damn close to 1, I'm going to get heads half plus or minus 1 over root n times and tails half plus or minus 1 over root n times. And if, as, as n goes to infinity, the fraction, which is up or down, with perfect confidence goes to 1. So probabilistic statements are always secretly, not that secretly, I'm not saying anything deep. They're really statements about confidences of basically 1 for the outcome of repeated experiments. Okay? If you only do something once, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. All right, and when we take that point of view, we can see that, in fact, the probabilities in quantum mechanics arise in exactly the same way as a consequence of the first postulate. Let's see how that happens. Let's go back to our friend, the spin. Okay. And suppose that uh, alpha or beta is not equal to 1. Okay, one is 0.7, the other 0 0.1. Whatever, cosine and sine of something. Okay. Um, OK? Now, the probability postulate tells you the probability alpha mod squared one, beta mod squared another, but forget the probability postulate. We only have the first postulate, that uh, if it's an eigenstate of something, then with eigenvalue that, it has that value. Otherwise, it has no value. So we look at this wave function, we say, sorry, I can't say anything about it. I don't know if it's up, down, nothing. I can't say anything about it. But that's not what you actually do in an experiment. What do you do in an experiment? you take many identically prepared copies of this wave function, right? So let's, let's, let's do that. So imagine, so we have n spins. So I now have a giant state, which is a tensor product of all these guys. Okay, so let me call this giant state psi sub n. Okay. Now, uh, I'll, I'll first make a loose statement, and then I'll say something more, uh, more precise. Um, I can define a probability operator. Let me define a probability operator. Probability to find the spin up as just the total number of up spins, the net up spin, divided by x. Okay. Now, there's a very simple claim. The claim is that as n goes to infinity, this state psi n becomes an eigenstate of the probability operator. And the eigenvalue is, surprise, surprise, alpha mod squared. Okay. Now, why does that happen? Well, if you, if you just very roughly look at this, uh, this is like alpha up plus beta down to the n. So when you extend it out, it's just like a binomial distribution with a bunch of ups and downs. And well, when you look at that object, uh, you find that as n goes to infinity, it becomes more and more dominated by the one that has alpha mod squared fraction of them up and beta mod squared of, them, of the fraction down, just by Poisson's standard binomial crap. Okay. So this is so 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 the statement is that. Even though a single spin doesn't have a well-defined value for spin up or down, okay, when you do the experiment a huge number of times and limit as n goes to infinity, the state does become the eigenstate of something of the probability, okay, with eigenvalue alpha mod squared. In fact, um, it, in fact, there's a more precise statement. Let me say that if I have some state psi, okay, I want to define not a probability, but a confidence that if I were to measure something, I would get some value. Because these are very, very closely related notions. The formula is exactly the same. Okay? But I'm going to call it the confidence that, because I'm only doing, there's one experiment. I'm not repeating anything. I have one wave function. 
And I want to say that when I have one wave function, if I measure some operator with some confidence C of lambda, I'm going to get the result lambda. And what is the confidence? Well, it's the projection operator onto the lambda subspace. Okay. The same formula for probability. But now I'm going to give a new rule. Okay. I'm not, if this confidence is ever a half, I'm not going to predict anything. Okay. I'm only going to predict things. You hand me the wave function. And the wave function tells me what things I can, I can uh, predict with what confidence. Okay. If I find some quantity that I can predict with confidence 1, then I can make a sharp prediction. But that never happens in real life. right? Experimentalists, for example, do the experiment a finite number of times. And they quote statistical errors on their results. So you have to decide, what confidence do you want? How many zeros do you want to go out to? Okay. Let's agree. We go out to 10 zeros. If the confidence is 0.999999, I'll make, I'll make a prediction. Okay. I stress this is a prediction about a single outcome experiment. I'm not repeating it. It's like the statement, I believe the sun will come up tomorrow. Okay. I say that with great confidence, despite the fact that there could be you know, a neutron star hurtling through space at nearly the speed of light, aimed right at the sun, that'll just kill it tomorrow. Okay. That's possible. But uh, you know, I put that confidence low enough, even though it's a single, it's about tomorrow. Not I'm going to measure the sun over and over again. Tomorrow. With confidence very close to one, the sun is going to come up. Okay. Now, here is the claim. So I'll say the, uh, the general claim. Um, Suppose you have a general operator O, okay? Um, uh, but the state is going to consist of n copies tensored with itself n times. So for the particular case where the state corresponds to repeating the experiment many, many times, okay? <clears throat> now let me define the observable uh, to be the average value of what I get from doing the n experiments. Okay. And this formula very intuitively tells you that the confidence for getting some value for lambda average is just the sum over all the lambdas of, well, the probability for finding the state. This is phi, sorry. Okay. Uh, times delta of lambda average minus lambda 1 plus lambda n. Okay. So I'm defining that to be the confidence that I get the value lambda average. Clearly, the integral of this quantity over lambda average gives me 1. So I'm getting a, OK. Now something very nice happens in the large n limit for this formula. Okay. In the large n limit, um, and since time is short, I won't go through this derivation. I actually encourage you to do it yourselves. Okay, uh, begin by, Fourier, by expressing the delta function as a Fourier integral, and then try to do a systematic expansion in one over n. It's very similar to the steps that go into proving the central limit theorem. If you've seen that in statistics, it's more or less exactly the same derivation. Okay? But I'm going to tell you the answer, and the answer is what really happens when experimentalists do measurements and what they mean by systematic error. As n goes to infinity, c of lambda becomes up to factors that normalize it to 1, becomes a Gaussian centered on the expectation value of the operator in the state phi, and with a width given by the variance of a root n. So delta O squared, as usual, is delta of O squared minus delta of O squared. So this is a statement that this confidence as a function of lambda is centered around the delta of O and becomes a sharper and sharper Gaussian. The width of the Gaussian is 1 over root n. Sorry, yeah, the width of the Gaussian is 1 over root n times the variance of O. So if you stop the experiment after 
a thousand times, there's a, you can't predict with confidence one what the result is. But you can predict it with a pretty good confidence with a width that scales like one over root f. And that's why experimentalists quote statistical error. Looks like one over root f. Okay? So once again, this is really, uh, so probabilistic theories really make predictions about confidences that are very close to one in the case where they get, in one, one special case is where you get to repeat the experiment over and over again. All right. But now that we can think about the way to make probabilistic predictions in a theory with a unique one-way function, you don't repeat the experiment over and over again, this immediately solves, the, uh, at least in zeroth order, the conceptual problem of how you're supposed to make probabilistic predictions in the universe. Okay. So what happens is roughly this. We have a giant wave function, right? One wave function for the universe. But what happens, because the universe is big, and because the universe has nice properties like approximate homogeneity and translational invariance, okay? Um, when we talk about, so let's, let's take a specific example. Uh, the predictions that we make from uh, inflation, okay? That's a nice cosmological prediction. It has to do with quantum mechanics. Okay, the fluctuations are made quantum mechanically, as I'm sure Paolo will explain to you. So what does it mean when, when, when we predict delta rho over rho? What the heck does it mean? We're applying quantum mechanics to the universe. What are we actually doing? Well, what we're doing is this. There's a huge wave function, let's say, for simplicity, for the massless scalar field, okay, that corresponds to the inflaton. There's a giant wave function. Why is it giant? Because there's zillions of different K modes, okay? Zillions of different... Uh, momentum modes in this giant box, which is our universe. Okay. Now, because it's one wave function, suppose I wanted to make a prediction for what I'll see if I measure one of the modes. I can't do it, right? I can't repeat the experiment over there. One of the modes I, I can say nothing about. But what, what I can do is the analog of what you do here. Here, we have the experimentalists. They repeat the experiment over and over again. In the case of the universe, it's a little different. Because the universe is approximate translational and rotational invariance, we can talk not about making predictions for a given k vector, but assuming rotational and translational invariance and things like that, we can talk about what is the typical slice fluctuation that I would expect for a k vector of this length. I fix the length, okay? But now, for a k vector with a given length, there are zillions of modes, right? Zillions and zillions of modes. So I ask that average question. Okay? And for that average question, I get to make a prediction. I get to make a prediction, and the confidence, the n that goes in there, I can't predict it precisely, but the n that goes in there is what? It's the number of modes. Okay. It's the number of modes with a fixed k. Now, we normally colloquially say this, like the universe did the experiment many different times in different places. Okay? But formally speaking, it's because there's a giant wave function that has great symmetry <laughs> that relates different components of it. So that when we ask a suitably average question of that wave function, we get to make predictions with high confidence. Okay? And the confidence is given by 1 over the square root of the number of modes for a given k. That's why we're screwed with cosmic variance. When we talk about the very, very biggest modes, we have a few of them. So the square root is pretty large. And we don't get to make a very confident prediction. Okay? That's just life. That's life with a probabilistic theory. Okay? You'll never be able to do better on that cosmic variance limit, especially the universe is now accelerating. We're never going to see any more modes. Okay? That's it. That's quantum mechanics. Okay? The little pat on the head that we all got when we were learning the subject, oh, it's okay, you still get to make prob predict probabilities, is only for this highly idealized case where you get to have infinite number of approximate copies of the same thing. Okay, so bottom line of this whole discussion then is A, we can certainly uh, we can talk about one wave function. We can talk about, we don't have to talk about repeating measurements. That's really the same as one measurement on a giant wave function. And that's what we actually do in the universe. That's what we do when we talk about delta rho over rho, for example. There's no wave function collapse. But being able to make sharp predictions in quantum mechanics is correlated with infinities. It's correlated with having infinitely large apparatuses, infinitely many uh, possible measurements. Only in that limit are there sharp, well-defined observables associated with quantum mechanics. OK? All right, very good. OK, so I have another six topics to get through. 
Uh, but let me. It is my time really is over, right? Yeah. It's true. Um. Yeah, I can't do river space in three minutes. Shit. Okay. No, I'll I'll I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. So next time, um, uh, we will start talking about. Um, uh, we'll keep going a little bit with this basic quantum mechanics. We'll talk about entanglement, uh, entanglement entropy, what typical states look like in large Hilbert spaces. This is related to the way the information paradox is going to end up being solved. Very basic things about, about, about quantum mechanics. So I'll finish up the basic things about quantum mechanics before delving in to the question of how gravity affects all of these things. Okay. And it should be obvious the way gravity affects these things. Gravity affects these things by making it impossible to have those infinities that we want in a variety of ways. Okay? When you're trying to measure some quantity, like, uh, I don't know, a two-point function here and there, okay? what we just went through tells you that you can do it if you make the apparatus here arbitrarily big, the apparatus there arbitrarily big, so things decohere exactly. Let's say you want a really exact answer. Okay? Um, but gravity tells us we can't do that because making apparatuses bigger and giving it more and more states makes them heavier and heavier. And at some point, they back react way too much on the geometry and they collapse everything into a black hole. Okay? So arguments like this and sharper versions of them, which I'll go through, limit, in fact, make it impossible to rigorously define local observables in gravity. This is something I'm sure all of you have read. And people say, you know, there are no local observables in gravity because of diffeomorphism invariance or because of x or y. And I mean, those things are related to the right answer, but they're not the right answer. It has nothing to do with diffeomorphism invariance per se. It has to do with the fact that gravity is universally attractive and that uh, you can't get the separation between apparatus and system sharply and cleanly uh, uh, when, when gravity is involved. Okay? So, um, so We'll talk about precisely what that means. How big is the effect? Um, this is the usual sort of statement that's uh, used to say that in asymptotically flat space, the only things we can predict are the S matrix or boundary correlators in the ADS CFT. And when an experimentalist hears these words, they say, bullshit, what am I doing in my lab? <laughs> right? I'm not measuring an S matrix. Screw you. Uh, I'm, I'm measuring something. And the answer is, yeah, what you're measuring isn't sharply defined. There's no experiment you can do that will reduce the systematic error on your answer to zero. There's always an inevitable error to any local experiment. And we'll quantify the size of that error. And what we'll then see is that there's an inevitable, uh, there's an inevitable fuzziness to notions of locality that are naively really tiny, but in a variety of contexts can become order one even macroscopically, even in situations where the curvature is low, even in situations where you think effective field theory is valid. One example is for black hole formation and evaporation, and the other example has to do with the sitter space in the landscape. So that's what we'll end with tomorrow. All right, thanks a lot.